Hi, this is David Dickens, and today we're going to talk about a retirement income literacy test that I found and took online, and I found it to be very entertaining. I hope you find it to be really educational. And what I really hope is at the end of this, you hit the link at the bottom of our podcast and take the test yourself and figure out exactly where your retirement literacy is. I'm going to go get Walter, and let's get started. Do you need help protecting your finances as you enter retirement? David Dickens of KC Financial Advisors has got you covered. Welcome to the Cover Your Assets KC podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Walter Storholt here with David Dickens. Once again, Cover Your Assets KC. We've got a fun show today as we get a quiz. I I feel a little under the gun today because David told me, hey, be ready for the questions, even though I don't know. I have not received which questions I'm going to be asked in advance. So, Oh, it's more, a blind draw. You, yeah. <laughs> more pressure than usual, David. I love it. But I, I, think, I think even you are going to enjoy this, although I am putting you a little bit on the spot. That's all right. I should have learned something over the course of doing this show with you over the years, so I should be able to handle this, I think. I think you can handle it. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Well, before we dive into the quiz, uh, I, I hope you are doing well. I understand that you had uh, several days crawling around on the floor with the grandkids and, and having a good time, and, and uh, that, that must have been a lot of fun. I did. We, uh, we let our uh, daughter and her husband take a little a five or six day vacation. So it was just Linda and me and these three boys. And oh my gosh, I, we just got a refresher as to why parenting is for the young. But these boys are super nice, super well behaved. We had a great time, but the the resting up part is where I am right now. <laughs> well, that's the nice thing about uh, about being able to, you know, step in, help out, take care, and then being able to kind of step back away when you need it, right? Yep. So it's all good. And uh, now... Back to business. Well, speaking of business, uh, you found this this quiz. You teased it a little bit there. It's it's more questions than we're going to cover on the episode today. We're not going to do all 38 of them. But, yeah, this would be fun for anybody to do. In fact, after, I know you're going to give me a primer of six questions today. And then uh, I'm going to go in and take the rest of this quiz when uh, after our recording today so, to see how officially I do on the rest of the quiz. So everybody likes quizzes and, and little tests and seeing how they perform. And, and the goal of this is to see kind of just where, where we stand with our knowledge about income and retirement planning and all those kinds of things. Exactly. So my, my hope here, regardless of your age, as you're sitting there listening to this podcast, regardless of your age, my hope is that you will be entertained enough by these six questions to say, you know what, I'm going to go do this 15-minute quiz myself online. We're going to provide you a link. And the plan would be that you identify, you get some, some glory out of the things that you know, but that you identify the things that you don't know and then you maybe Google some topics to try to expand your knowledge on those particular topics. And as you, my experience with myself and with clients is, as you gain more knowledge about these topics you don't know about, you're going to gain more confidence and more control over your retirement finances. And that's a good thing. And so that's why I chose to do this as our podcast today. I hope everybody finds it to be pretty entertaining. All right, I'm raring, ready to go, and uh, primed for these questions. So, you want to get to it? Well, yeah. So, just a teeny tiny little background. This this quiz is an annual quiz put out by the American College of Financial Services, and they a couple of their findings are these: that the more money you have, the better you do on this literacy quiz. Of all the people that took it uh, last year, and I I highlighted that number. On this, um, on this piece of OIC, 3,765 Americans aged 50 to 75 took this quiz last year. And the average score was 31%. Uh, the people that had more money scored higher, twice as high. They scored about right around a little over 50%. So as you're taking this yourself and you score 60 or 65%, <laughs> You should feel pretty good about yourself, unless you happen to be in the financial industry. I took the test myself because I thought, well, this, this would be falling off a log. I'll get 100%. I got 36 of 38 right, which baffled me. I said, well, I went back and studied the two that I went wrong and said, <laughs> well, how did I miss those? I, but in going back, I realized exactly how I missed those. So it was educational for me. I hope that our listening audience finds it educational for them. And Walter, I hope without too much stress, you find this a little bit entertaining 
today. Yeah, I think I can handle it. And uh, knowing that you missed two helps me, uh, you know, just helps give me a little bit of confidence, a little bit, little we're bit, not gonna, little bit of breathing I'm not going to give you those two either. I'm, <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> Although I'm happy to disclose what they were, but I didn't find them particularly uh, important to our audience. Okay, gotcha. More. So number one, mm-hmm. a 25% negative single year return in your retirement portfolio would have the biggest impact on the long-term retirement security for yourself if it occurs, and here are your choices, 15 years prior to retirement, at retirement, 15 years after your retirement begins, or the timing of that loss doesn't matter. Okay. I think the timing of it does matter. And I'm going to say at retirement would be the biggest impact on our portfolio and our retirement security. I think you are exactly right. Woo-hoo. And that's probably because you are familiar with something called the sequence of returns study. That's that what was done. rattling so, around in my brain. Exactly, <laughs> David. Yes. So if, if, if our listeners happen to miss that one, well, they've now heard the answer. So they're probably going to get it right. But it would be an interesting little Google search to do sequence of returns. If you want to do a little bit of reading as to why the worst time to have a 25% down year is the year or two or three right after you retire. So congratulations, Walter. You are one for one. I am happy. Can I retire on top with a perfect record? Is that, is that possible? <laughs> no. Just end the episode You there? got five more, but honestly, <laughs> the way you swung and hit that one right in the middle of the bat, I'm feeling really good about the next five for you. Okay, excellent. I like that a lot. By the way, I was going to look and see, um, unfortunately, I don't think we have, or at least I can't find it on quick reference. I was going to look for an old sequence of returns risk episode that we've done, David. I'm not sure we've ever actually done one. I don't see a specific, I'm sure you've mentioned it before and and why it was rattling around, but nothing with a heavy focus on that. So I don't know, maybe file that away for a future episode. Who knows what we might do for the next episode. Yeah, exactly. There you go. (laughs) All right, I'm okay. ready for question two. I, question, won't re- I won't retire. Okay. Question number two. Which of the following strategies is least likely to improve your retirement security? Saving an additional 3% of salary in the five years prior to retirement, working for two years past your planned retirement date, deferring Social Security benefits for two years longer than originally planned, or I have no idea. <laughs> I like that that's an answer. Like, I don't know. Can that, is that a correct, an- that would be a correct answer. So you technically can't count me as wrong if it's, I don't know. <laughs> I guess that's equivalent to a pass. Hmm. Yes. All right. I'm really torn between the say that we're talking least likely to improve. I feel like working two extra years past the planned retirement date would have a big impact. So I'm going to eliminate that one. The 3% salary for five years doesn't sound like an enormous improvement, whereas delaying Social Security could certainly create a lifetime of increased dollars in your pocket. So I'm going to go with the saving 3% of salary. Would be the least likely to improve your retirement least likely. security. It would improve it, but least likely to improve You, it. my friend, are exactly right. Whew. All right. So, and what you also said was, well, each of those would improve your retirement security, and that's correct. So just quick, scratchy numbers. And boy, am I hesitant to talk about numbers because after the last episode. <laughs> where we almost made you sign on the dotted line that there wouldn't be numbers today. But. I did sign up. I had a couple of, of listeners say, man, that was a lot of numbers. So we're not doing that today. Uh, but unless, you work- unless you're an engineer, don't go listen to the last, don't listen to the last episode. <laughs> if you work an extra five years and you save an extra 3%, let's just say for round numbers that you earn 200 grand a year. So that would be an extra $30,000 that you would save. If you work two years past your planned retirement date and you made 200 grand, and at that point, hopefully you're saving at least 15% of what you make in your 401k uh, for the extra two years, that's an extra 60 grand. So double the 3% you would benefit from in, in in the prior. And then deferring Social Security benefits, well, everybody knows by listening to this podcast that each year you defer, the dollar amount you get every month goes up by 8%. So let's just say that this person was going to get $3,500 a month, but by waiting, they get $4,082 a month. That's a difference between 
42,000 a year and almost $49,000 a year. So, you know, seven grand for 18 years of retirement, that's more than $110,000. So your best strategy is delaying Social Security. Your second best strategy is working an extra two years and still pumping away at your 401k. And then your least effective strategy, but still positive, is by saving more the five years right before you retire. And if you do some mix of all three of those, well, just think of the impact of all that. So Exactly. You do yeah. all three of those and <laughs> you're going to retire happier. Yeah. No okay, doubt. Walter, <laughs> you are two for two, my friend. I'm celebrating over here, but I don't well, want to I, I don't want to celebrate too soon. I think this one is you know this is a total layup for you. Okay. A 65-year-old male in America has an average life expectancy of approximately how many more years? 10, 15, 20 or 25 years. I feel like I've heard this stat before, and it's oh, right I around 85 have. years, so that would be 20 additional, um, I'm thinking. That is exactly right. All so right. a lot of people think of life expectancy in America at about 75 years, and that's true if you start from age one, age zero. But once you get to be 65, a lot of bad stuff that could have gotten you didn't get you. So the, the point of this question is, if you're 65, you need to plan on at least a 20-year Retirement. Your money has to last you at least twenty years, and your and, spouse. And we're still talking is, an average at that point. So fifty percent of you are going to, you know, exceed that to some measure. Exactly. And the longer you live, the longer your life expectancy is. And females have a little bit longer life expectancy than males. So if you're if you got a spouse, and you're concerned about how she's going to make it after you're gone, then it's just a helpful benchmark to say I need to make sure that my money, as I'm doing my planning lasts at least till I'm 90. And our planning here uh, at our shop, we always take it out to 100 to make sure that people have money uh, at least through age 100. And if they do, we feel like, okay, they're in a pretty good spot with your plan. I like it. I like the three for three. I'm feeling confident. Two to go. Or no, still three to go. Okay. fifty. Per at least I'm at 50% though. That's, that's not too bad. Yeah, you're killing it. This one, uh, actually the next two are true false. Oh, all right. 50-50 chance here. So, true or false, the death benefit, this is, I don't even need to ask you this one. This is all, this is guaranteed oh, to no. be correct. Watch me get it wrong. <laughs> the death benefit of a life insurance policy owned by an individual is income tax free to the beneficiary. True. That is exactly true, and you are exactly right. So, that is really good. That money is really good for, let's say you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s and your spouse, whether you're male or female, your spouse is going to need to, need to replace your income for a decade or two or three. So having that tax-free money come into your house after you're gone is a really good thing. I have clients that have uh, done life insurance policies to pay for estate taxes. So their heirs get that money tax-free and then they pay for their estate taxes. I've had clients that have done it for a business purchase if they die prematurely. So the long and the short of it is, tax laws back in the 20s or 30s, 1920s or 30s, there was a, an insertion that said payouts from life insurance policies on death benefit are tax-free for individuals. And so that is, uh, first of all, you're exactly correct. Second of all, that's a really nice benefit uh, when you're dealing with the grief of having lost somebody, but at least this big chunk of money that comes in, you're not giving a bunch to Uncle Sam and, and the state you live in. I think that's great perspective, David, and uh, I can point listeners in a lot of directions where we've talked about that topic in the podcast. Um, I think a really good one would be episode 186. Go check that one out. Life insurance after 65. Three good reasons to consider. Uh, we'll link to that in the description of the show today if you want to go learn a little bit more about why life insurance is an interesting and powerful tool, even for retirees who often assume that they don't need life insurance anymore. But, uh, yeah, and one other thing on that, yeah. we have a bunch of listeners in their 30s and 40s. And if you haven't seriously, if you haven't made a serious calculation as to how much my preference would be term life insurance, super cheap, but if you haven't made a serious calculation as to how much term life insurance you need in case you get hit by a bus, or your spouse gets hit by a bus, if your spouse is a working outside the home spouse, then you, have, you are doing yourself a dramatic disservice in the very unlikely case that you or your spouse dies young. 
That's why it's so cheap because it's relatively improbable. But if it happens to your household and you are underinsured, oh my gosh, it leaves a really difficult problem for the person or people that you left behind. So regardless of age, uh, you need to know whether or not you need life insurance and make a calculation as to how much. It's a great point. In fact, I'll link to two episodes, David, just so that we can cover uh, those different age ranges. We'll have the one for folks who are over 65 and might want to think about life insurance. But then we did another episode uh, kind of just talking about how to find and buy uh, term life insurance and might be a great episode for anyone of any age. That was episode 128. We'll link to that one, too, so people can get a couple more pieces of information to work with on that Terrific. topic. All right. Very good. What do we have? Two left? Two to go. I, I can do this. You're killing it, man. You are uh, you are batting a thousand right now. Another true false. Okay. A retiree who is working part-time can generally continue to contribute to an IRA or a Roth, depending on which they would like. Okay. So uh, a retiree. Somebody's already retired. Already Maybe retired. Maybe they're already taking Social Security. Maybe they're already over 73 and taking required distributions. Can they contribute. I don't see why not. I'll say yes. True. That is true, but it wasn't true before 2019. Oh, that was at a Secure Act change. Exactly. I so see. you used to be able to, if you had earned income, and and the, the key here is you have to have earned income. You have to have a job. Doesn't matter if it's a part-time job or whatever it is, but you can't invest interest in dividends or your RMD <laughs> back into your IRA. You can't do that. But if you have a part-time job, and uh, you want to continue to, you don't, eh, maybe you don't really need the money. You can contribute to an IRA or a Roth. And the question is, well, what tax bracket are you in? And so that would help you make that decision. But you can contribute eight grand per spouse to an IRA or a Roth. And let's say you want to do a Roth for you and a, an IRA for your spouse. Doesn't matter. That's perfectly fine. But yes, uh, as of 2019, you can also, you can, you could always do a Roth, but now you can contribute to an IRA or a Roth up to the maximum, which is $7,000 plus the 1,000 of catch up contribution because you're over 50. So eight grand per spouse. If you have 12,000 of earned income this year, you could contribute the entire 12,000. Let's say you would 6,000 for your IRA. 6000 for your spouse's IRA. You can do 100% of your earned income if that's a fit for you. Gives people more flexibility, and, and we like that in retirement, right? Absolutely. And if you're in the right tax bracket, then instead of popping that money into a, into a savings account or a CD, you pop it into your Roth. The money grows tax-free. You take it out tax-free. It's really quite a deal for people who work part-time in retirement and don't really need the money, maybe they're bored or whatever their reason for working in part-time in retirement. Uh, but yep, that's money you can continue to save for yourself or your heirs. Okay, very good. I'm down to one left, huh? Yeah, and I don't think this one's gonna be a big problem okay. for you either. I, you know what, Walter, I, I'm hopeful that you take this quiz and, and let, at least let me know. I'll be real interested to see Frankly, any listener that takes this, if you just shoot me a quickie little email, I would love to know. My guess is that if you listen to podcasts like this, you probably have a higher retirement income IQ than the vast majority of, of Americans. So um, anyway, uh, this one to go seven for seven, or is it six for six? Where are we here? We're just doing six. You're trying to throw an extra one at me all of a sudden. Well, I could, but <laughs> frankly, we're running up against the, we're probably almost 20 minutes in. So the final one, Walter. All right. Of the following options, since inflation is, is a thing these days, and it hadn't been for so long, I chose this particular question. Of the following options, the best way to protect against inflation is to have a diversified portfolio of stocks, a diversified portfolio of traditional bonds, a diversified portfolio of certificates of deposits or CDs. Or I don't know. <laughs> or I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to go with stocks because we want to outpace inflation in order to protect against it. And uh, stocks give us the best chance of doing that. It's exactly right. So the bond or the CD, or frankly, if you have a pension, 
if you're retired, you've been retired for 10 years and you have a pension and it's fixed, which most of them are, you dramatically realize what we're talking about here, which is the purchasing power of that, the interest that gets spun off of a, of a bond or a CD or your pension, its purchasing power is significantly less today than it was two, three, five years ago. So that what it doesn't mean is that if you're really worried about inflation, you should have all your money in stock. No, 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 no. You would have to have a really, really big nest egg or a really high risk tolerance to do that. But what it does mean for the vast majority of retirees, and this is not financial advice specifically for you, but what it does mean is that stocks need to continue to be a portion of your retirement portfolio for the vast majority of retirees because they do help you keep up with inflation, sometimes beat inflation. And what you really want to do is make sure that by the time you reach your 80s and hopefully early 90s, that your portfolio hasn't been eaten away by two things, your spending and inflation. So Walter, you, you slayed this. Ten, uh, six out of six. I was going to say 10 out of 10, but I, I can't give myself <laughs> the extra four. <laughs> I have a feeling that if I'd have found four more, you might have just gone 10 for 10. Well, I, I can't wait to honestly take this, uh, this quiz. I'm going to do it as soon as we're done. I'll let you know what I get. Good. I'm excited to hear that. The ones I missed were, were kind of backwater uh, questions. As you're taking the exam, I missed question number two. And uh, I don't know. It's, the other one's pretty far in the back. Maybe question number, I don't know, 20-something. Nice. Um, but there's, it's a broad-ranging list of categories. And what they try to do is to give you enough of a... Um, of a broad look at the, the topics that come up as you're approaching and into retirement. I think it'll, the ones you miss are the really going to be the most important ones. You can revel in the ones you got right, but I'd encourage you to just do a little bit of study for the ones that you got wrong and fill that hole. And then it's going to, if you do particularly poorly on the exam, then it might be an indication that you need a lot of additional education or you need a good financial advisor. If you do pretty darn well on this thing, it probably means that you're a really good do-it-yourselfer and you need to just do a little cleanup work with a good Google search and explore the answers that you got wrong. Either way, I do hope you'll take the 15, 18 minutes that it takes to do this uh, literacy quiz, learn from it, and if you're so inclined, shoot me an email with your results. Love it. You can get in touch with David. Um, probably the best way would just be to send him an email. Uh, ddickens at kcfa.com. Let him know your results on the quiz. And if you got a few questions wrong and you're kind of wondering, hey, well, how can I... How can I, I want to learn from this, you know, what, what can we do to kind of fix that equation or and fix that problem? Well, fantastic. Uh, let them know which of those questions you had trouble with. And if you are struggling to find the answers through just Google as well, uh, even better to work with an advisor to uh, kind of help with that financial education piece. You can also get in touch through the website, coveryourassetskc.com as well. Um, but yeah, talk to David about maybe your financial and uh, retirement planning concerns. And this is a great quiz to see what your literacy is looking like when it comes to retirement and income and those important topics. So take it again. We're going to link to that in the description of today's episode, along with two additional episodes about those life insurance topics we discussed. And uh, this was an informative episode, David, and we didn't get too much uh, lost in the numbers on this one. So you, you are, you are <laughs> Thank redeemed. Goodness. You are redeemed. Well done, sir. <laughs> Love it. Well, thanks for joining us on today's episode, everybody. We will look forward to talking to you again in a couple of weeks, right back here on Cover Your Assets, KC. Advisory services offered through Creative One Wealth, LLC, an investment advisor. KC Financial Advisors and Creative One Wealth, LLC, are not affiliated. We are an independent financial services firm helping individuals create retirement strategies using a variety of insurance products to custom suit their needs and objectives. The information and opinions contained in this program have been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. They are given for informational purposes only and are not a solicitation to buy or sell any of the products mentioned. The information 
information is not intended to be used as the sole basis for financial decisions, nor should it be construed as advice designed to meet the particular needs of an individual situation. This material has been provided by a licensed insurance professional for informational and educational purposes only and is not endorsed or affiliated with the Social Security Administration or any government agency. It is not intended to provide and should not be relied upon for accounting, legal, tax, or investment advice.